So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, businesses and industries that have been just completely disrupted over time. Some of them survived, but they just ended up being a fraction of what they used to be, and some of them just completely went out of business altogether. And uh, you know, to kick this off, we're gonna we're gonna look at Blockbuster. And, and Jason, what what were your thoughts on Blockbuster as as being one of these kinds of companies? Yeah, I mean, who doesn't remember you know in the '80s and '90s going to a Blockbuster on a on a weekend and looking at all the movies to pick from, getting some overpriced popcorn, all that good stuff. But Blockbuster, talk about a shell of its former self. There is one remaining Blockbuster today in Bend, Oregon. And, uh, you know, the story of Blockbuster is a lot of different things. A lot of people look at Netflix, which I think is a huge part of it, right? In 2000, uh, Netflix offered to sell to Blockbuster for $50 million. And the CEO said, quote, the dot-com hysteria is completely overblown. And now Blockbuster went on to file bankruptcy about a decade later. And contrast that with what the Netflix CEO said at the time that said, most companies that are great at something do not become great at new things people want because they're afraid to hurt their initial business. And I think that's the story of Blockbuster. They were so focused on brick and mortar stores and extracting revenue by charging late fees. And even when they got rid of late fees, it was just too late. Um, the industry moved on. Customers didn't want to go to a brick and mortar store. They just wanted to get a DVD in the mail and then eventually just stream one from their smart devices. So I think Blockbuster is a great story of a company that did not adapt and they're kind of relegated to history now because of it. So anyway, that's Blockbuster. Um, another one that I think we were talking about was Kodak. And Greg, you had some thoughts to share about Kodak, right? Yeah, Kodak. The Kodak moment. I feel like uh, that was a phrase that just rung true for... Uh, the bulk of uh, the the end of the 20, 20th century there where everybody had kind of that that mentality of if you want to catch an image or a moment it's going to be a Kodak moment and we have those little uh, those little catchphrases that uh, have been popular with a lot of brands and they were the one of the big ones the unique unique thing about the Kodak story was within their uh, innovation and their research they had developed uh, if not the first uh, IP for digital cameras, at least some of the first, and had already some prototypes for digital cameras. So the trouble was, similar to the Blockbuster story, their business model was the idea of sell a disposable camera, let's get the film per, uh, processed and let's maintain that film revenue. Uh, and without that revenue, they couldn't imagine a world where you sell a camera that was digital. What do you do with pixel pictures. Nobody wants that. So they shelved that idea. They protected their investment. They believed was their renewable product. So this is also encapsulated with the general business model idea of the razors and blades model, where you sell something cheap so that you can get the continuous revenue of that replaceable product, like in film sales. So Kodak's interesting uh, challenge there. And of course, we know the story with the digital camera because we all have one of those in our pocket. <laughs> so yeah, that was a difficult one. They had a chance and uh, kind of passed it up. So I think there's an interesting story around an airline, uh, a kind of a golden oldie, the golden age of air travel. Uh, Rob, did you have some thoughts on uh, one of those? I did. It was it was on Pan Am. So okay. Uh, this is a, an airline that was doing really, really well. They were first in many, many ways. Uh, they were the first to have, I believe, it was international worldwide uh, flights. So you can go around the world on a Pan Am plane. Uh, they were luxurious. I mean, get this. You could drink champagne, eat steak, and have caviar on their planes. But, you know, these weren't for uh, people who typically shopped at Walmart. These were for the elites. These were for the wealthy people. And um, they were just going gangbusters on building up this business of international air travel. They did not have any domestic airlines, even though they were trying to get into the U.S. market for a while. But um, more on that a little bit later. So they branded themselves as the world's most experienced airline, just because they had all this experience with international travel and, and all that. They were, I believe, the first to take a Boeing 747 and put it into use. And actually, if you've read the news recently, they've just discontinued the 747, uh, mainly because people stopped buying these giant uh, gas-hungry airplanes. And speaking of gas-hungry, they got into these planes, I believe bought something like a half billion dollars worth of these things just before the gas crisis of the 70s. And I, I believe I found somewhere gas prices went up like 400%, and they're putting these hugely fuel inefficient planes in the sky. Around the same time, we saw a worldwide economic downturn. And so these rich elites stopped flying quite so much. 
And so now they're putting on un, full flights into the air with this very expensive fuel. And it, they were hurting from this. Again, still trying to break into the uh, domestic American market. But at that time, um, existing competitors had lobbied Congress to basically prevent them from getting in uh, for fear of them monopolizing the United States air travel market. Mm. Well, eventually they get into it and they they realized they can't build an airline from the ground up. And so what they did was they, they acquired uh, an existing airline. I believe it was National Airlines. N nothing I ever heard of it uh, now. I mean, they were bought many, many years ago. So they buy this airline, try to integrate with it, but they had major cultural incompatibilities. They had different equipment. The mechanics didn't know how to uh, work on both different types of planes. And so that ended up costing them tons and tons of money. But um, basically where they kind of lost out is they, they went all in on international air travel. And it turns out that they weren't, they weren't really factoring in the risks of uh, fuel prices going through the roof like it did. Um, they weren't factoring the challenges of not being able to operate in both international and domestic markets. And then there was a, even a terrorist attack that happened that they were found responsible for uh, ultimately not preventing this from happening, even though at that time we didn't have nearly the same strictness with uh, uh, what we have now with TSA getting onto planes and, and how much they're you know, trying to protect air travel. Um, so long and short, I mean, they, they had a very, very complicated business, very high barriers to entry, and a couple of big mistakes, and they're out of business. So no more Pan Am. But then there's another one I want to talk about. So uh, BlackBerry, back in the day, I mean, everybody had a Crackberry, right? <laughs> Even now, President Obama was like, you're, you're going to not take this away from me uh, when he became president. But people loved those full QWERTY keyboards. They loved that clickety-clack, right? You got the immediate tactile feedback. And, you know, they stuck to it. They had really, really strong security measures in place. So governments and financial institutions loved Blackberries for uh, how, how securely they could send information mobile. Um, but then the iPhone, that came out, something like January of 2007. And it completely changed our perception of, of what we thought of when we thought of a smartphone. But it still took a few years before this started to really upset uh, BlackBerry's business. And um, yeah, ultimately the kids were playing with them, got the video games, but you didn't have the full keyboard and it wasn't quite the same. Um, but eventually, people really wanted the iPhone. Even business users started to like it, and their security got better. And all the features that BlackBerry had were starting to not really become value-added features anymore. And um, it almost put them out of business completely. So they've, they've completely left the handset market uh, in terms of mobile smartphones. But BlackBerry is still around. Uh, they pivoted, and now uh, primary parts of their business include Internet of Things for um, automobiles. So there's a lot of their software is actually running in the Microsoft Sync system that's uh, in a lot of the cars you bu we buy these days. And uh, they're, they're still in security. That was one of their uh, strong suits. And so they do cybersecurity and have a, have a number of products and services around that. So um, while not quite the same company, I believe I checked their stock price as something like 10% of what it used to be in their heyday. Mm -hmm. uh, they're still around. They're still a viable company. And um, they're still doing things that kind of what they used to do aside from making the mobile phones. So hmm. at this point, I'd love to hear what you, your guys' thoughts are on uh, just general other trends that we're seeing now. Like, do you see any industries or any companies that you feel might be the next Kodak or the next Blockbuster? Um, Jason, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, I have for a long time said that insurance is probably the worst part of adulting. Um, I've had to purchase insurance and, and get insurance quotes and, and I'm a fairly educated guy and I never know exactly what I'm buying. Like I could spend dozens of hours pouring into the, the edge cases of what's covered and what's not covered and, and why does this complexity arise here? And I just, I'm not an expert in insurance by any means, but I've been doing some, some looking around and it seems like that, that industry and whether it's the health insurance or life insurance or auto insurance, it's just ripe for some some really digital disruption. That a, that a company that could sell a really simple product that people can understand, maybe use some automation, like automating claims or automating the applications process, things like that. I think you're seeing some of that in the in the broker space, but really in the in the insurance provider space, I think that that industry could be ripe for disruption because much like Blockbuster, it seems like you know, they're, they're providing a product that people need, but sometimes it seems like there's just some of their revenue is more from revenue extraction rather than providing value. And so that's my uh, non-expert opinion on that one anyway. Uh, what about you, Greg? Do you see any industries that could benefit from some serious pivoting in our near future? 
I think so. Um, Maybe not so much industry, but there's there's kind of a two pronged problem I think that we we see. And one, it has to do with uh, with HR, human resources, how we look at mm-hmm. individuals when it comes to uh, integrating into societal uh, benefit, both from an economic standpoint, industry standpoint, and that goes back towards how the educational model is built as well. Um, all the foundations for how we learn, how we consume information, how we validate that information, and then how we get credited with that by way of degrees and the institutional mindsets that have sustained uh, decades and centuries of ideas um, are becoming challenged because the rate of information is numbing. And uh, when you get a textbook in hand, the day you open that up, you're looking at old information that's already outdated. And many times it's incorrect. We've learned something already that has displaced that information. Uh, Recently, we just had uh, some interaction or I had interaction with one of my past students who's in a curriculum uh, uh, industry. And so curriculum for them is challenged because they're used to binding paper books and now they're going digital. And how do you make references to online resources that may or may not be there tomorrow? And how can you do that sustainably? So just one aspect of the educational model is challenged by rights of the curriculum. And I'm saying as a whole, I think institutional thinking in education has to change. The idea of being able to make a decision and then have eight, nine months, two years, three years to implement some grandiose idea will never fly. And so much like governments and other things that are very large, too big to fail. I feel like education thinks it's too big to fail, but I'm going to throw the caution out there. I don't think they are. I think they will fail if they're not careful. So being being ready to embrace change and being able to look at a different model of thinking by way of students' information is going to be huge. And then HR industry has to be willing to adapt and look at things differently as well. I think the traditional mindset of a resume being good enough, it just isn't. And there's plenty of employers have already communicated that stress. Uh, but there has to be a rethinking of how we integrate from um, industry, society, from how we're educating the ground up. So um, that's kind of a big nugget, but that uh, it's, it's been my passion for a while is rethinking education. Um, and I think it's going to come to a head sooner than we think. So that's what I got. I totally agree. Um, in, in, with the education thing, that's we're in, we're educators, so I mean, we, we see a lot of uh, the way people learn as adults is sometimes a little bit different than the way we learned as kids. And I don't know if that's right or wrong, but yeah, that's a big topic. Um, one I was thinking about was cable companies. Oh man, I could rant for hours about how I can't stand cable companies. <laughs> Right. I mean, seriously, their their business model is basically, hey, look, you've got two providers that can um, offer you any kind of service, and so they're they're effectively a monopoly, even though it's like more like a diopoly. And so my cable provider, they just keep up upping my fees, maybe 10, 20% every year. Oh, but they get you in on those intro packages, $50 a month for the first 12 months. And then by the time a couple of years have gone by, you're up to $120 a month. And you know, I thought about it, like, how, how do you circumvent them? We need another technology because clearly we can't have a, a fourth and fifth and sixth competitor laying cable wires all over the city. That, that would not be a great idea. Um, and existing models don't seem to be working with just a few companies sharing the same lines. Um, until recently, I discovered Verizon, and I don't own stock in Verizon or anything, but um, they tried to offer me a package where they basically set up an LTE device in your home, and much like your phone runs off the wireless uh, network um, when you're mobile, this device would operate off the same LTE network and offer internet to your home, basically 5G LTE connection speeds in your home. And they were telling me something like up to a, a gigabyte per second I was like between three and a gig or something like that. It was a lot for like 40 bucks a month or $30 a month, which is a third of what my cable bill is. So without getting too far into it, these solutions you're starting to see come into existence. Uh, They're getting around the wires. I think we'll see more competition when it comes to the cable world. And I think it'll force cable companies to either innovate or get out of the way and just go the way of the dodo bird. They already lost cable TV for the most part to the internet. Um, They're still selling the internet, but once they don't have the internet anymore... (laughs) Uh, I, yeah, I'd love to see some of the current cable companies just go away. Anyway, uh, so that, that probably wraps up this video. I know we had a lot to talk about with existing companies and what we thought might be happening in the future. So uh, for all, the, all you users out there and all you subscribers, that's great. Thanks for watching our video. But if you haven't subscribed, hit that button. There's a subscribe button and there's always that bell if you want to get the latest updates. And of course, don't, don't forget to hit the like button. So thanks.